Well, hello there, motherfuckers, and welcome up to a review of WWE Superstar Showdown. So, and I promised I would review this show. Now, I know I backed out of uh, the Saudi Arabia show. I didn't watch that one earlier this year. And so people are probably saying, like, oh, am I going to review this show? Um, you know, is this... Like, am I going to bother with it because it's like an international pay-per-view? Is it really going to even matter what happens? And I said I would because, you know, you had Triple H against The Undertaker on this show. So so you, you know that I'm going to be invested in this show. I'm going to be the, at least interested to see what's going to happen. And um, what did I think about the show overall? It wasn't bad. Um, I mean, it wasn't blowing my mind or anything like that. It wasn't incredible. I really did like Taker versus Triple H. I thought that was a very good match. Um, you know, everything else you could say that it was, you know, it was good, but not like stellar. Um, and, you know, for like a show that's kind of like just a throwaway show, you know, this show is just like, you know, they have a deal with Australia they're going to keep going back there. So, you know, it was nice. You know, it, it was cool to see a different environment. You know, they showed the uh, the arena was super huge, 70,000 people. And, uh, you know, they actually had women that were able to compete on this show. So that was nice to see. Um, you know, and they showed the outside like in Melbourne. And it was pretty cool. And they hadn't had a show there since the um the global uh warning show which was actually a really good show um i remember i, I had sold the dvd to fye but i had it it you had brock lesnar versus triple h versus the rock in a triple threat match and that was a really good match um so that was a good show so you should go watch that one if anything, I don't think they have that one in the network. I could be wrong. But that was a very good show from what I remember. So I would go check that one out if you haven't seen it like on YouTube. Or if it is on the network. Uh, because I would watch it again if, it, if it's on there. Um, but, you know, they hadn't had a major show on there since that time. So it was uh, it was good to see them back in Australia. Um you know, now it's like I don't like it. they're doing like all these corporate deals. It just makes the WWE feel so corporate. And, you know, it's like they're giving the illusion that they're bigger than ever, but they're actually smaller than they've ever been. The WWE is irrelevant, but they try their hardest to make like they're big they're they're the biggest thing in wrestling still i don't care what anybody says about how the indies are hotter than ever the you know the wwe is still at the top of the wrestling game but as far as like a global enterprise that they're not they're giving the illusion that they're oh we're having shows in saudi arabia we're breaking down barriers the first ever women's pay-per-view were leading the way in women's rights. Like you're, they're trying to paint a picture that's just not there. They're painting a picture, and the picture is not going to be hung up in the Smithsonian as they're like making it out to be. It's just not gonna happen, folks. Um, so let's get to this show. You know, big show in Australia. You know, kangaroos were jumping everywhere. People were barbecuing in the audience. If shrimp was on the barbie, okay. Well, let's just get to this show. Um, the New Day defeated the Bar. This was a good way to open the show. No complaints here. You know, uh, I'm just so fucking sick and tired of the New Day. I, I've, I'm just really like I've said this on every single pay per view, every single SmackDown I've reviewed this year. They have got to get Big E away from these two goofballs. I, I, I mean, listen, Kofi and Xavier Woods are talented in their own right. You know, they've gotten themselves over. They're smart, intelligent. Um, they're athletic. But this is just lame-ass shit. I mean, it's enough with the colorful stuff and the pancakes. I mean... You know, and they've done it long enough. I've never, I'm surprised at WWE. Usually Vince would, like, not go, he didn't even go this far with DX. It just shows it's like he's got a good thing going. He doesn't want to stop it. I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? This is, 
you know, it's going on for way too long already. I guess they're still selling a lot of merchandise that might be what's behind it. They're counting on the kids and everything. But then again, I mean, I think it's mostly you, you got people my age uh, wearing this shit. So it's like, you know, something um, I don't think it matters if they break them up or whatever the case may be. You know, they could still do this as a as two people. They don't need Big E there. It's just, you know, whenever I see Big E, this big muscular dude that has the potential to, you know, be a star on his own without having to be relegated to the pancakes and all the other bullshit, um, it pains me to see. And it's time for a change, you know. And the bar, it's like, you know, it's so crazy. I, I like the bar as a tag team. I've, I've said this time and time again. It's two guys that, you know, they weren't really doing much with them at the time. So they kind of just put them together. And they work as a team. It, it, and they were trying to make them a dominant team. But they've gotten, you know, a lot of stuff got in the way. Like the Shield reunion and all that nonsense. And, you know, they, they just kind of, it went awry. And, you know, it's funny when you have Michael Cole talking about how Sheamus was like a former world champion winning the belt like four times. And, you know, here you just see him in a tag team match against the New Day. Um, and I believe he was the one who got pinned. Uh, uh, no, actually, I think it was Cesar. Wh whatever the case may be. He's in a tag team. And the thing what's funny about this is most wrestlers, they start off in a tag team and then they usually end up as a single star. Well, nowadays it's like you end up in a tag team when they have nothing else to do with you. Like Dolph Ziggler is a world champion. Now he's a tag champion. I mean, you would never see this back in the day. The only time they would do this is when they were building up for a big match. You know, or they just wanted to do like a pairing or so. They did it like with Batista and Rey Mysterio, for example. But that was before Mysterio won the championship. But they wanted to do like main event tag match. So it was a different thing. You know, and they also gave John Cena and Shawn Michaels the tag belts. But they were trying to do that to build up towards their match. Triple H and Stone Cold. But that was because they were supposed to be winning every belt to be able to take over the WWE. It was a two-man power trip. Now it's just like, we don't know what to do with these guys, so let's throw them in a tag team. And, you know, Sheamus, he still looks like a main eventer and, and all that, but it's like, you know, you look back on it and you're just like, damn, this guy has fallen so far that, you know, he's just wrestling against these pancake throwers. And you're just like, what the fuck happened to... Triple H's workout partner. Uh, well, I mean, like, why is even Triple H allowing this to happen? If it, did they have a falling out or something? Because it's like, it was only in 2015 that Sheamus had cashed in the money in the bank and won the world championship from Roman Reigns, and we thought that Sheamus was in, was in line for a, a whole push and everything like that. And you know, then a year later, he's just you know, thrown into a, a pre-show match against Cesaro, and then he's just in a tag team again. This is how it is. This is how it is with all the wrestlers. And you're going to see this, like, when AJ Styles loses the belt. He's going to end up as a, you know, in a tag team or something. They're going to, like, maybe tag him up with Jeff Hardy or something. Like, look for that in the future. You're going to see, like, uh, AJ thrown together with Ty Dillinger or something. They're going to just you know, do something nonsensical like that. Because they feel like the only way they could get get somebody and keep them over is to just put a random belt on them. But it, they don't understand it looks ridiculous. Like, you, you got Seth Rollins, for example. And he's been a world champion multiple times already. He had the big moment at WrestleMania cashing in against Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, right? And now he's carrying around the IC belt. And the way they cover for that is he's it's the workhorse championship. You see what I'm saying? It's like this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Sheamus. It's like this guy, they're talking about all his accolades. And you know what was funny? When Michael Cole was listing all the accolades, the last thing he mentioned was the world championship. 
Like, that should be the first thing out of his mouth. Not that he's the Royal Rumble winner. Not that he was the king of the ring. Not that he was money in the bank holder. It it should be the first thing out of his mouth. He's a world champion. It's like being a world champion doesn't matter anymore in, in WWE. You, you win the belt and it's just like, oh, it's just another, like, notch in your belt. When it should be like, you know, back. In the day when someone would win the world title, it was like that was the be all end all. Now it's just like, well, it's just another belt that you win because, uh, like, so many people have won it, it doesn't even matter. So, you know, that's, that's basically how it is now. So they're not going anywhere with this. And I would look for the bar and New Day to be together for probably another year or so. They look like they have no interest in moving forward with any team. And you just feel like there's no development. Nothing ever changes with these teams. They don't. The only new implementation they made to New Day's Act was pancakes. So instead of unicorn horns, it's pancakes now. Um, up next, it was Charlotte uh, defeating Becky Lynch by disqualification. So, you know, it was interesting to note that the Aussie crowd is is very much like the UK crowd. They're very smarky. 70,000 people or not, I was actually very surprised to see that, well, they're just as smarky as any UK crowd. You know, they were cheering for um, Becky, they were booing Charlotte, and, you know, um, this was another really good match. I, I mean, I, I was enjoying it for what it was. Uh, you know, I don't get why everyone is booing Charlotte like, these marks, man, like, I, I don't understand it, like, why are they booing Charlotte, for what, what, you know, what is the thing about her that makes her worthy of booing, she doesn't exactly have any heel heat going for her, Becky, they're cheering because, you know, they want to be, like, counterproductive to the, to the heel turn, they, you know, uh, Smarks have it in their mind that she's the next Stone Cold Steve Austin, and they, they won't let up on that comparison, even though it's completely ridiculous. So, Becky hits her with the belt. It's a disqualification, and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, they decent for what it was, a non-finish, because you're not going to get any, you know, belt changes of this magnitude in Australia, I guess, uh, so, but it, it was good, no complaints here, there was nothing particularly wrong with it, you know, I've said it time and time again, these are two great, I say my criticisms of, you know, how they're handling the Becky Lynch thing, or, or more how the fans are handling it, and I don't have a complaint with either one of these girls. I mean, I, you know, they're both really good. I hold them in high regard as far as their talent. I mean, I, I can't help but feel that they should elevate Charlotte. She should feel more important on these shows. Like, this is Ric Flair's daughter. When you look at her, she looks dominant. She's so much taller, bigger, more muscular, more fit than the other girls. I don't think that they've really honed in on... You know, and really tried to elevate her to the best, the best of their abilities. So that, like I said, they could do way more with her when it comes to that. She should feel more important. Uh, they were getting to that on Raw, but since she's been on SmackDown, it's been like Charlotte Light. Like she, they just don't make her feel as important or as like you know, th like she's a big deal. Like this is the number one woman on the show. Uh, we started off with Elias and. And, and Owens before the match, before the Cena match. And, you know, I like Kevin Owens. I talked about, you know, on Raw, how this guy, he, he acted like a real pro and all the boos were going on when they made that Seattle Sonics comment. And, you know, he acted like it didn't bother him. You know, they didn't let the crowd shake them. I thought it was great. I thought it was a good moment. Some good heat there and the heels... They acted like, you know, they weren't bothered by the, the crowd response, which was great. It really spoke volumes about Owens and how he is as a verbal performer. It's, some, you know, that's something there that's lacking. It's something that we saw during the Attitude Era, that they wouldn't let the crowd get to them. Uh, but Owens just sitting next to Elias, he just doesn't look as important as Elias. He doesn't look as much of a star as Elias. 
John Cena debuted his his new haircut. Um, people have been giving him shit about it online. Apparently, uh, he looked in amazing shape. He's like all leaned out, uh, training with uh, Jackie Chan in China. It looks he looks amazing, um, and he looked like he hadn't lost a step in the ring at all. Um, he also debuted the new punch move, which was a uh, a bit surprising to say the least. They did say he was going to debut that move. It was a punch, and you know, I guess it's to play off the fact that he's training in China now with Jackie Chan. Uh, I can't. I would be lying if I said it. It, it wasn't a bit odd, but I, I guess it was cool to kind of play up that fact that he's training with Jackie. So. You know, it just was a bit surprising after seeing matches end with the attitude adjustment to see this. It's called the sixth move of doom, which I guess is a little bit funny because everybody always talks about the five moves of doom from John Cena. So he calls it the six moves of doom. Um, I did feel like Lashley was a bit of an afterthought in this match. Like, I know they wanted to make it like, oh, these are two big stars. Lashley could bask in the glow of John Cena's limelight, and it just, Lashley didn't even feel like he was there, especially when John Cena cut the promo at the end of the match, and he, you know, talked about he didn't know what his future was going to hold, That, but he knows he's in front of the crowd, he thanked the crowd, and then they moved on, uh, and it, you know, like, it, it didn't really feel like Elias or Lashley were a part of this match. It, it, it didn't. I mean, it was just a simple, basic tag match. It was good to see Cena again. It's like, man, you could really tell for all the people over the years that gave Cena shit, you feel when Cena's not on Raw or SmackDown, these shows are fucking more terrible than ever. They need that Cena star power. You see the minute he comes out there, it's like, you know, you know that like things already improve a little bit. Because they've got a big star present. So they, what, despite love him or hate him, the WWE needs a John Cena. The Iconics defeated Asuka and Naomi. Oh my God. Like, what are they doing to Asuka? They bring this poor girl in with all the hype. They give her the Royal Rumble win. First ever women's Royal Rumble. And what happens? She loses her streak. They don't even try to protect her in any way. And here they are. You know, I guess, what was it? Naomi got, um, you know, was the one who got pinned. But these girls, they're so awful in the ring. And I know that they were in Australia. And I know that's why they got the win. But, my God, they're still on TV on SmackDown. These girls, they're so goddamn annoying. And not in a heel heat sort of way. We always talk about this. They're they're so bad. <laughs> they're so terrible. But yet they're still on the show. And they're giving them victories. I don't care if we're in fucking Australia. It didn't even seem like the crowd even cared about them. Peyton Royce is hot as hell. But who the fuck cares about this team? They're not good wrestlers. They're not good talkers. They're, 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 they have no value here. They're attractive, but if that's the case, you know, you're putting them in the ring all the time. You're just using them as talent, in the in-ring talent. This is it's not going over well. So I don't know why they keep persisting with this. They're 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 not good. They're not going to benefit you as in-ring talent. So stop trying to make them serious wrestlers. And you know, you want to give the Australian crowd. You already had something planned on the the card. That the Australian crowd did like. So there was no point in booking the Iconics here. Uh, AJ Styles defeated Samoa Joe. This was a bit better of a match than the one they did at Hell in the Cell. Which I couldn't even fucking sit through. Um, I like, you know, they, they had AJ working the leg. And they, they kept that through to the end. He slapped on the calf crusher. That was the win. and That's it. I mean, Joe tapped out. They got the, the new number one contender we we're going to talk about in a little bit. Oh, boy. We're going to talk about that number one contenders match in a little bit. Just you wait. I've got quite a bit to say about that one. Um, but you, this is it, right? Samoa Joe tapped out. The feud's over, right? Please, for the love of God, tell me it's over. 
I have never sat through... I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's hyperbole here. You know, I was going to say I never sat through a more boring, but I did. I mean, the past few AJ Styles feuds, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens. I mean, man, this AJ title reign. Oh, my. Guys, they put together a list of the top five SmackDown stars. And they had this motherfucker at number three. Now, you guys know I like AJ Styles. I've talked about a talented guy. He's good on the mic. I don't know why when he's a baby face during this feud, his acting is so abysmal. But he legitimately has improved since his days in TNA on the mic. And when he was a heel, he was cutting some legitimately good promos. So I don't know what happened. But number three on the list. They have him on the list with The Rock, with The Undertaker. A list that also doesn't feature Batista. Or um, who else didn't they have on this list? You, there, there was a lot of key players missing from it, but they did. Oh, Brock Lesnar, for example. Can you believe Brock Lesnar? And also, I don't think Kurt Angle was also on the list. I mean, you're talking about guys that in 2003, that was their year. They they couldn't put these guys on there, on the list. And I'm like, oh my God, you're going to have AJ Styles just so you could put him over? I mean, that's why, but I mean, when you look at the list, it's a fucking insult to those past talents. I mean, man, what 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 the hell are they thinking? I mean, but this it, that's got to be it. I mean, everyone's talking about, you know, these dream matches, oh, Samoa Joe is champion. Thank God it didn't happen. I mean, man, Samoa Joe, he's so out of shape. He's so boring in the fucking ring. This match was better, but it's probably because it was the last match in the feud. And that's why, at least I'm, you know, that's probably why I'm saying, like, I didn't mind it. It was good. It's a no disqualification match. At least they started the match brawling in the aisle way, which was good to see. You know, at least a bit of continuity, the storyline. He didn't wait till they made the in-ring announcements. Oh, you know, the world champion. So that was good. You know, they, they, they fought the show. They couldn't wait to get at each other. So that, that was good to see. Um... But, you know, they didn't even, like, break any of the rules until, like, 10 minutes into the match. They're not grabbing at chairs until, like, 15 minutes in. And I'm like, why is this even a no-disqualification match? Uh, you're not even using any weapons. You're not even breaking any rules. You might as well just made it a regular match. Um, so... You know, it, it, it wasn't bad for what it was. Uh, you know, it's the last match in the feud. Thank fucking God for that. And, you know, uh, it was alright. But boring feud, and when will they end it already? I mean, you know, AJ Styles deserves better than this. But they have booked this guy into obscurity. They have made his title reign just a total bore in every way, shape, and fashion. Uh, Ronda Rousey and the Bells defeated the Riot Squad. Uh, match was good. I liked the finish with Rousey doing the double arm bar. It was a fun match. And, you know, I watch Ronda Rousey and I still see people giving her shit. But she is one of the most entertaining parts of the roster. And she is doing a great job. You know, in a WWE that is falling apart, that just has, you know, nothing to look forward to or nothing exciting. I do look forward to seeing Ronda Rousey and, you know, her performances. I think she does a great job. You know, I still, you know, at the end of the match, she's grabbing her heart and smiling. I'm like, baddest woman on the planet. I, I mean, I know they're, it's not her fault. They're telling her to go out there. They're telling her to smile. They're telling her to be likable. I'm just like, man, can't she just be a baby face? Just you, you guys always talk about comparing Becky Lynch to Stone Cold. Well, why can't Ronda Rousey be the female Stone Cold? Wouldn't that make more sense? She'll be a badass that breaks the rules, you know, acts ruthless, but she's cheered because she's so cool. What, what you know what I'm saying? But instead, she's touching her hand to her heart. She's hanging out with the you know the Bella Twins, which are the girly girls. I'm just you know. I'm just confused about, like, the direction of her character. But she's a great talent, and her transition from to the ring is... It's, to me, it's been a success, I think. I think she's very good in the ring. 
And it's a pleasant surprise. And hey, I was giving her shit more than anyone here on YouTube about, you know, them shoehorning her in here and all that stuff. So, but, you know, I'm pleasantly surprised at how she's turned out. Um, Buddy Murphy defeated Cedric Alexander for the Cruiserweight Championship. And, you know, this would be the point where I'd say 205 Live is garbage. And, yeah, it is. But... Once again, the match, it was pretty good. They get, These guys gave it their all. It was a spot fest, but I guess because I don't watch so much 205 Live, it, you know, it seemed a bit more crisp. They at least, you know, sold for the big spots a bit more. Cedric Alexander, you know, he hits... The, the one thing I got to say about this fucking match, when he, when he hit... The uh, back bra breaker, which is an impressive move, um, that what, the lumbar check. There you go. I've I've said it time and time. Again. That's a cool move. I think that's a very dangerous looking move. Uh, but what, whatever the case may be, if he, as long as he does it in a safe way, um, it's a cool looking move. I just don't think anyone should be kicking out of it, especially you know. I hear people talking about like Buddy Murphy looking like a star. First of all, let's get one thing straight. Buddy Murphy. The name. Like, I'm sorry. I just can't watch somebody named Buddy. And Hey, I, you know who I really love? Buddy. Hey, you know, I, it's like, I think of just like Air Bud. I think of just like, I don't know, a kid. Uh, or, or just something non-threatening when I hear Buddy Murphy. But everyone talks about, like, this guy's cool. He's a badass. His name is Buddy. Like, and I don't even think that's his real name. But they call him Buddy. I'm just like, well, first of all, right off the bat, the name fucking sucks. It's just a horrible name to give to a wrestler. It's just like, they're better off just calling him Murphy, right? Just like Cesaro or, or, or you know, any other name, you know what I'm saying, Rusev, just, just, I, I just call him Murphy for fuck's sakes, call him something, like, even calling him Robert Murphy or something like that, or Bobby Murphy would have been better, Buddy Murphy, Buddy, I mean, but the guy looks good, both of these guys are more in shape and look more like stars than two, than the other 205 li uh, livers, I mean, you know, but it was a good fast-paced match. Um, looked like they sold a bit more than your average 205 live match. And Buddy Murphy actually ended up winning here. Now, they gave him the win because it was in Australia and everything. But the thing about this match is like, okay, you're going to say that I don't watch 205 live. But, set, you know, this is still a WWE pay-per-view where it's like, you know, they haven't been showing any 205 Live matches on the pay-per-view. It's just been exclusive to 205 Live shows on the network. So, you're talking about, you know, Cedric Alexander's big long reign and all this shit. And I don't give a fuck about him, like, losing the match. It also, isn't Buddy Murphy supposed to be a heel? And he's, like, grasping the belt like Shawn Michaels as a babyface winning it at WrestleMania 12. First of all, it's the Cruiserweight Championship. Second of all, you're a heel. And third of all, stop fucking crying. I mean, you know, I understand it's supposed to be an emotional moment. He's winning in his, in his hometown. But I've said it time and time again. Can these guys act the part? Can they act cool? Is that everyone always have to cry? Do we always have to break character? Every two, we're in my hometown. I, I mean, come on. You know, how come, I'm, I'm, like I said, I've been going through the 1997, um, you know, Raws, and there was a lot of times when they were in Canada, and Bret Hart still played up the heel thing, and they still liked them because they were in Canada. Why can't we get that same thing going? Why can't Buddy Murphy still act as a, as a heel? And I don't know how effective of a heel he is. He makes a mean face. I guess that's what qualifies him as a heel and they say that he's a heel so I guess he's a heel but okay he's supposed to be a heel so that's his character so why is he crying face first into the fucking cruiserweight championship like he just won the big one it's the cruiserweight championship a belt that no one cares about I know 
you know, Wade Keller is talking about Rey Mysterio returning and, you know, he hopes he goes to 205 Live and he wants them to talk about how passionate he is about the division. I'm sorry, but 205 Live is just a one-hour show on the network that barely anybody watches. I know it's supposed to have gotten better. If you ask me, 205 fucking died the minute Enzo, you know, had to give up the belt due to him being fired. That That's about it. I mean, that show doesn't interest me anymore. Never interested me, even when Enzo was on it. It's just, you know, Cedric Alexander, it's not getting it done. And Buddy Murphy is certainly not going to get my attention to watch 205 Live. But, I mean, like I said, if you're talking about matches and these guys giving it their all, you better believe that they gave it their all. I mean, this was a nice little match right here. I enjoyed it. I certainly wasn't bored during it. I said it was, this was a pretty tight card. I mean, there was some entertaining in-ring action on this show for sure. I mean, but you could clearly see that there's just a lot of stuff here that needs fixing. That may, these matches would have been even better, you know, had we had stories and characters going into them. Um... The Shield defeated Braun Strowman, Drew McIntyre, and Dolph Ziggler. This is another really good match. I, I I know this spot's been overused, but I did like this time when... um I, I thought they were going to go for this obvious spot when they were at ringside. They were going to go for the... Um, Braun Strowman was going to... He was trying to mow down every member of the Shield, so he hits Reigns. Then he hits Rollins with the shoulder tackle. And then, like, they had the steel steps outside the ring. And it looked like a very obvious spot. The Braun was going to charge at Dean. He was going to move out of the way. And then Dean was going to... I mean, it, yeah, Dean was going to move out of the way. And Braun was going to crash into the steel steps at ringside. And that was going to take him out of the match. But just as he, as he goes for Dean... Roman comes this way, intersects and spears. I thought that was a really nice spot. That's a very overused spot. I've noticed since like 2011 or so, they've been doing that spot a few times a year. And it's been so fucking overused. I mean, you know, that breaking through the barricade. It used to be a cool spot at one point. But now they just like do it every single couple of pay-per-views. And it's like... Oh my God, Michael Cole shouts out through the barricade. And it's just like, I'm not going to get excited. I've seen this spot so many times. It's like certain things they feel like they need to do. Like another like spot I noticed they've done maybe from like 2014 or so on is like one of the big spots is like somebody throwing another guy over the desk. And it's supposed to be like an impressive spot. I, you know, it's like, I remember, it's like, they still throw people, like, onto the desk and put people through the announce table, but now, like, a lot of times they'll just, like, throw them over the desk, and that's supposed, you know, you see it's like a spot that they're, like, obsessed with, and the barricade spot is one that they're really obsessed with, but I thought it worked out nicely here, um, and they also did a nice job of like building a little bit of drama during the end of the match where it looked like maybe Drew and uh, Ziggler might end up getting the win. But at the last minute, Dean Ambrose got the win. And, you know, they tried to build a little bit of drama. Also, is Dean Ambrose going to turn against? They've handled that so shittily. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Like, good match, fun match, entertaining match, guys giving it their all. They seemed like they were, everyone, you know, was excited to be there. They were performing at another level. I think that was the thing. I think it was a very nice arena. Crowd seemed, you know, hot. They were smarky, but they just, the wrestlers seemed like they were on tonight more than usual. Um, but the thing is with the Dean Ambrose thing, they should have gotten on this shit the minute Dean returned. Instead, like a bunch of lazy bastards, they wait two months till after his return. Is it? He just got back. He's got a new look. And also, can, can we also... Also, I got to talk about something else with Dean Ambrose. So let's talk about something else with Dean Ambrose. Here, can, can we talk about something for a moment here? Dean Ambrose is the husband of Renee Young. And I want to talk about something. 
People were saying, oh, am I going to rant on how much Renee Young sucks? Guys, Renee Young is the best announcer on Raw to me. And I'm not fucking kidding. She's the only one. It's nice to hear a woman's voice for a change instead of these other bumbling doofuses. No more, you know. And I like that, you know, we didn't have to. That was also strange. They also didn't have a separate announce team for SmackDown. Which I still think is kind of stupid that Corey Graves is on both shows. So, you know, it's good that they just did away with that. But, man, I mean, like, how many years... Are we supposed to listen to Michael Cole? I mean, for, for like I've talked about Michael Cole in a lot of different videos, and I've talked about how I felt about Michael Cole. So, you know, let, let, let's talk briefly about announcers here and everything like that. Michael Cole is, is, you know, when he first started out, they gave him the opportunity to take over for Jr. when he was out with Bell's palsy. I think he did a good job. You go back and you watch WrestleMania 15, and I think the guy did a very good job. The only thing is, like, you know, when they were hanging Big Boss Man, you know, from the hell in the cell, I was like, Michael Cole totally botched calling that match. He did not, you know, show enough shock and excitement there. But for the most part, he did a pretty good job for a newbie. I, I, I And his voice... And a lot of times people don't give him credit for this. His voice is on a lot of different, very popular Attitude Era moments. You, you think about it, the whole build for WrestleMania 15, JR was barely there. So it was up to Michael Cole. And, you know, you could say that the King brought out the best in him. And I do believe that. But Michael Cole, you know, if you really sucked, you wouldn't do a good job. You know, so, you know, like I'm saying, you got the Mike Adamleys of the world. So you see that Michael Cole put in a good effort. He did a good job. And I said that Michael Cole was not a half-bad announcer when SmackDown became his own brand. And Michael Cole was really getting a chance to shine. Um, and, you know, after he started taking over for JR, he was, you know, starting to get boring. They made him sound really wooden. When he became a heel announcer, I thought he was doing a bang-up job. I really liked Michael Cole as a heel. Because I was saying, if the crowd don't really like Michael Cole, and they see him as a, a poor man's JR, you might as well make him a heel. And they did, and I thought it was very entertaining. A lot of people didn't like it for some reason, but I loved heel Michael Cole. I've talked about that before, and I'd love to see a return to that. People were saying that Michael Cole was going to turn heel when he started apologizing for the, the Matt Hardy skits and stuff, but, you know, that never came to be. So, you know, Michael Cole's a mixed bag. He, he's very, very wooden in his delivery, and we all know that he's just basically a Vince puppet. He, you know, he they don't let him ab-lib as much. It's probably not even really his fault, but, you know, some other guys are a bit more... Corey Graves is a bit more exciting than Michael Cole even, but... You know, Corey Graves has a lot of lame lines, and I'm just, I, I, I can never get into Corey Graves' commentary. It's just, and he's also very, like, there is a lot of times when Corey Graves ad-libs, and the way how he, like, sounded towards Booker T and Coach so many times, he just annoyed the fuck out of me. So I, I really just don't like Corey Graves. Since those guys haven't been there, there's a few times where he, like, said things to Renee Young. I didn't like, he's just an asshole. I just don't like Corey Graves. But, but anyway, Renee Young is very pleasant to listen to. I think she's fun. She has a very cute way of calling the matches. And I think it's enjoyable. Is she one of the best announcers of all time? Fuck no. Like I said, you, you know, you've had a lot of good announcers. Uh, would I rather have Booker T or Coach there? Yes. Definitely more so Booker T. Booker T made Raw fun, at least, you know, verbally on commentary for me. But if we're going to have somebody there, you know, Renee Young is, is fun to listen to. I like to hear a fresh voice, and she's doing a good job. She doesn't sound like she's ever getting stuck or has a loss for words. She gives her input. And, you know, when you've got McMahon shouting in, in your ear, if anyone could do a half-decent job, I mean, I give credit. I give credit to, to all of them for at least, you know, putting out what they did because Mick Foley revealed it. 
Vince is more of a madman than ever on commentary. Even JR said he could barely even do it anymore. Uh, why they don't put Mauro Ronaldo out there is beyond me. They should be paying... You know, if Mauro Ronaldo has a problem, like, being on TV and all that, I say whatever he's getting paid in NXT, double that shit. Because Mauro Ronaldo is one of a kind. And to me... To not have this guy calling like WrestleManias. Like this guy's voice should be over all these moments that they're having. And I guarantee you they would be more memorable if Mauro Ronaldo was calling them. Because Michael Cole just doesn't do any justice to anything we see. And we saw that Hell in a Cell. What did I say? One of my biggest complaints about the Hell in a Cell is that the commentary fucked all that shit up. And I talk about it when they do Elimination Chamber. None of these guys have enough stress or a sense of urgency in their voice. And they don't put over the matches or the talent enough. They don't tell stories well enough. And I know that's not McMahon. That's them. You just They're not good enough commentators. It's just it's how it is. Cole is bored. He's been doing it for too long. He's tired. I don't think he has the passion of a J.R., or a Jerry the King Lawler. or so you know I like Renee Young. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, so you know uh, I don't know how we got into talking. About oh, I almost missed my point. That's why we started talking about commentators. You've got Renee Young paying compliments to Ambrose. C can we just please stop? Just admit that that's your husband. You know what I'm saying? You already had Samoa Joe make a crack about Dean Ambrose and all that. Just, 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 just admit it. Just admit that that's your husband in there, that you're proud of him and everything. It's like, why does it matter? Can I ask a question? If you're going to be, if they're not even going to protect themselves and they want to make social media such a, you know, it's right there on the screen. Hashtag Superstar Showdown, right? Hashtag SSD, right? I feel like it should be SSSD, Super, you know, Superstar Showdown, whatever. Maybe they felt that was too many S's. But it, you know what I'm saying? It's like, if you're going to you push social media so strong, you even try to have your own social media platform and tout. You know, you you, tr you try your damnedest to get everybody to make you go trending, and you succeed a lot of times. So, Renee Young's got an open Instagram page. Pictures of her there lying in bed with Dean Ambrose, going on vacation with Dean Ambrose. I love my husband, Dean Ambrose, the sexy man, Dean Ambrose. It, and you're the commentator on Raw, and you're calling his match. And I'm just like... Why do we have to, like, pretend? If you're not going to pretend on Instagram, if you're not going to pretend when you have an open Instagram account for everybody to see, why bother putting on a, a performance? You know, it's like, I see what they're trying to do. It's like, they, they, they kind of want to have, like, a separation and everything. But, like, it's like they don't know when to have continuity and when to not. So first they started doing Mix Match Challenge right on Facebook Live. And then like they didn't want to continue it on the show. Now they're doing that. So, but like, okay, so we're doing that from the internet. So you already got people on Facebook. So we're already on social media seeing what's going on in these wrestlers' lives. So, okay, and they want to show Naomi and Jimmy Uso, uh, you know, as a couple. But it's like... At total random, it's like okay, we're gonna put them together, and then it was like remember Lana and Rusev on screen they break up, but in real life they're really getting married. Remember the whole Summer Rae Dolph Ziggler thing, um, but then they like bring them together at random, but they were apart for so long. It's just like why do they do this? Just save yourself some trouble. Like stop being lazy. I know what they're doing. They just don't want to write this shit. Because it'd probably be too complicated. But you'd have so much of a better show if we would, you know, if you're gonna just, you know, if you're gonna be negligent when it comes to kayfabe, then kill it 100%. Kill that shit dead and you will probably have a miles better product. The product would be so much better. It would be true to life. You know, it, it, it's like, just make everything a shoot then. 
Make it a reality show. Take your Total Divas shit and make that like a reality. On Apply those same concepts and it would be more interesting. You'll see these real wrestlers' lives playing out on TV. So it would blur the line. Wrestling's fake? Well, not anymore, right? Well, the in-ring stuff would be fake, but the actual storylines might actually, you know, they could be somewhat real. They have so many opportunities here, and I say it week after week in almost every single review and rant. Just These are just the ideas of a random person on the internet. I'm sure many people have even better ideas than myself, and they just don't take advantage of any of them. I see, you know, it's so obvious. Like, you're already there on social media, so why not just do it? Just take the plunge. Daniel Bryan defeated The Miz to earn the right to face the world champion. So we're going to have a Bryan-AJ match. That sounds like a good match. I'm all for that match. Finally, something that seems a bit more exciting. I'd recommend turning AJ heel for this. But, you know, they're probably going to go for the baby face versus baby. I respect you. Oh, God. Uh, don't do this Ring of Honor stuff. That's how it was in the beginning with Ring of Honor where everyone would shake hands. It was lame. It, that, and that concept didn't even last a few months. What happened in this match? I said what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about it right now. Well, this shit happens far too many times in WWE. Didn't this already happen with, coincidentally, AJ Styles and Kevin Owens? And it involved the title change. So, you had Daniel Bryan rolling up the Miz. Like, with a small package. It was like a super sloppy count. It was like one of these deals. Like, one, two, three. And it was like, well, did he get him? Did he not? They ring the bell. The match is over. <laughs> what was that? I swear to God, guys, like, I said, like, remember I was complaining, I was saying, where's the Daniel Bryan versus Miz feud? They should have taken advantage of this ever since the Talking Smack promo, you know, okay, they were waiting for Bryan to get healed up and approved by the doctors, they were still unsure of his concussions and shit like that, but so what What do they go ahead and do? They, they So they have the feud, it's terrible, Certain things about it are okay. We've got crying babies. We've got just a bunch of nonsense and everything. Weird finishes at pay-per-views. And what happened here? Obviously, that was a botch. But there's a black cloud over this feud. What What was that? Like, are the referees, like, you know, drinking before they come out there? Because this shit just happens way too many times. There's way too many mistakes with, like, like counts and stuff. How hard is it to count to three? You, you know, you, one, two, you know, like, okay, like, these are regular referees. The referees haven't changed. I don't forget who the referee was, but, like, he's counting to three, and, and, like, it's not even the end of the match. It was quite obvious that that was just supposed to be a transitional move, but there you go, and this was, like, the second-to-last match. So I'm like you're saying like, well, at least I kept the show in a nice, though know, very odd, this pay-per-view, I mean, I'll talk about that, like, I guess I might as well mention it now. The pay-per-view ended exactly at four hours, and I'm like, was that done on purpose? I mean, I started off the show, it automatically shows you where it ends, and I'm like, did they just clock in at an even four hours how the hell did they manage that the only time i've ever seen that is like an episode of smackdown where you know they they make sure the show is like you know gonna end by a certain time it's always been like that but for some reason they i guess that's because of this match i don't know if like they made it go short on purpose but could they have booked it differently so it didn't look so atrocious? And this had to be a mistake. There's no way that they would have let this happen. Um, if they're going to do the babyface versus babyface thing, that's super fucking lame. I really thought that they might have went with the Miz. That would have been better. Like an AJ Miz thing, that would have been interesting to see. Um, hopefully, you know, now the Samoa Joe thing is done. We don't have to see any more of that terrible acting. I'm... 
I hope to God, I swear to God, if we turn on SmackDown this week and we see Samoa Joe ambushing AJ, I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm just like, I, I can't stand this feud. And, and people are putting it over like it's good. <laughs> All right, uh, you know, it, they need to end it already. But uh, this match finish was super fucking weird. I don't know what happened here. Uh, that was a total mess, and it had to have been a mistake. Triple H defeated The Undertaker. So, you know, I, I, I like this match a lot. I thought it was good. Um, you know, it, it, you know, I'm not going to lie here and say, like, it didn't seem like the Undertaker was a bit, you know, slow here. But what do you expect? The, you know, they asked a lot from The Undertaker over the years. I mean, I, I always mention it when, when I talk about this with friends. I talk about in 2008, The Undertaker was falling off of a ladder through several tables. And this is when he was in his mid-40s. When he was wrestling Edge, remember at, uh, what was it, the... um the one night stand or whatever it was crashing through all those fucking tables. So, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not surprised the undertaker is a bit slow, but it was, it was good for what it was. It looked like at one point, like the undertaker, they, they fall in the crowd, which was something we hadn't seen in a while it was old school. They harkened back to the attitude era. It looked like one spot. It looked like they, they were, they were near a, a guardrail that was laying on the ground the Undertaker was going to go for a back body drop with The Undertaker. And then, like, Triple H kind of just, like, dead-weighted him. He sandbagged him. was like, oh, fuck no. I'm not taking that bump. That's probably what it was. It's probably like, hey, you know, we're not going for that spot. Like, it's probably like an unrehearsed spot. They probably just happened to come across that guardrail. What it was doing on the ground, I don't know. Maybe it was botched, but whatever it was. It was almost like... You know, we don't need to take big spots like that. And rightfully so. It was a great match. And, you know, the, um, Shawn Michaels got involved. There's just some weird things, like, that bother me, like, that I have to mention. The Undertaker, like, does one punch to, to Shawn Michaels. And it's like the motherfucker was hit by a Mack truck. And he sold this for, like, five minutes, like. He came back in the ring holding his face, and I'm like, I don't get it. Like, okay, is it supposed to be because Sean's retired? He just can't, like, take shots anymore. So, but he's supposed to be, like, wrestling a match in Saudi Arabia if they're still going to go through with that. And it seems like they very much are based on the conclusion of this match. And Shawn Michaels is, like, super, like, overselling the punch. And I don't know if he was supposed to go out there and, like, do that on purpose, but. I don't know. I thought that was a bit strange. Triple H did an elbow through the table on Kane. That was surprising. Um, just like I said, once again, seeing Kane out there. Just as as mayor. A fucking mayor. A current mayor wrestling. I mean, you know. The thing is, though, I also kind of thought about something. Jesse Ventura actually went in the ring and refed a match. You know, when he was sitting governor of Minnesota. So I kind of thought about that. But then, then I, I kind of came back around to my original point that I was making in my Raw review. Or the SmackDown review, whichever one it was. Kane is wearing a mask. And he's also wearing like an elaborate costume. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, he's going out there with a fucking Halloween mask with the long wig. Jesse Ventura just basically went out there and just refereed a match and didn't really even physically get involved that much. He might have punched Triple H or something like that. I don't really remember. But, you know, also that was during a hot time in wrestling. So it was like kind of like, oh, you know, pop culture, Ventura's in Minnesota. It's like, no, it's not even like we're in Kane's hometown what is it? it's oklahoma he's the mayor of the city in oklahoma whatever it is he, he it's they're in australia so this guy like excuses himself out of office and like just goes to australia like fucking on the other side of the planet and we're just like 
that that's what I'm saying. You're like, what? Whoa! Like, what is he doing there? Like, that's kind of strange. Um, but whatever. Needless to say, uh, Shawn Michaels interferes, super kick, pedigree. Triple H finally beats the Undertaker. Um, you know, it's to me that's just like. Uh, there's a few problems I have about this. It's like, they just had to give Triple H this win. Like, Triple H is at a point right now, we all know, that he doesn't need to be accomplishing anything else. He's already accomplished all he can with all his world titles, with all the pay-per-views he's main event. He's main evented more than anyone else. Believe that statistic still holds true. Triple H, you know, the leader of the most popular faction, DX, after Shawn Michaels left. You know, I'm just saying it's like there's nothing more for Triple H to do, but he just had to beat The Undertaker. I mean, The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak is already over. Did he really need to get that win against The Undertaker? You know, like, was it really necessary to stroke his ego just, just so he could have that one more accolade? I didn't think it was really necessary. They didn't really need to, you know, give him something else. Like, you know what I'm saying? He's already partially owning the company. There's no need to, like, give him that extra little boost there. So... At the end, I was like rolling my eyes. The the four legends are standing in the ring. And, and, and I know they did this at WrestleMania 28 and everything. And it was over with the crowd. And it was also over here as well. But I am so happy that they faked them out. And Because the thing is, it's like Shawn Michaels super kicked The Undertaker. Which led to him losing. So why would they all pose super happy? I respect you. So sick of that nonsense. So I was happy they just, you know, they picked them up, tombstoned them, choked, slammed them, and all that. So they'll probably have the tag match. And I'm excited to see Shawn Michaels back in the ring. I don't think it's necessary for Shawn Michaels to have to return at this stage in the game after he's been retired for so long. But the product is so terrible. So if I'm going to sit here and review these shows, at least I can enjoy myself and watch Shawn Michaels compete once again. I still can't get over the fact that the motherfucker shaved his head, though. What the fuck? I, like, I understand that Shawn Michaels' hairline was receding, but to shave everything off, uh, I mean, he don't look awful. It just looks so weird. Like I said, we all know Shawn Michaels for the long hair, and, you know, he doesn't have that anymore, uh, but whatever. So, anyway, you know, good main event there. The show was perfectly bearable. I gotta say, like, I really... It's a long-ass show. It's four hours, but I was thinking it was gonna be five. The show was pretty entertaining, though. I thought, like, most of these matches were pretty good. I was rolling my eyes at the Iconics, you know, that shit didn't need to be there, but, you know, everything else, perfectly good. I even enjoyed the 205 live match. Yeah, I even put over a 205 live match, people. What, what what you're not gonna probably ever hear that again, but like I said, I think the wrestlers were happy to be in Australia. I think that they were extra on on this particular night. They were excited to be there. They were having you know uh, they were having good nights. You know they were just um, they wanted to perform in, in front of a big crowd and put on a good show, make you feel like you were watching a good pay per view. So. Perfectly enjoyable. As a whole, I think it was kind of better than Hell in the Cells. If we're talking about, like, overall, I think there was more good matches. Um, I thought it was I thought it was a decent show at the most. You know, there was a lot of things, like I said, that bothered me where they could have improved on it. I don't know what the fuck happened during Brian versus The Miz. Like I said, that stuff's happening way too often with the botches, with the referees botching decisions on matches. But um, there you go, motherfuckers. I hope you all enjoyed the review. And, you know, um, I, 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 I finally got to review one of these international shows for you. So I hope you all enjoyed the review. Guys, you know, once again... Please make sure you subscribe to the channel. Resubscribe if somehow YouTube unsubscribed you. Because a lot of times, from what I've been hearing, 
that happens on here. You click the bell so you get all the new notifications when I post all my new videos. Check out some of my other videos I have posted here. And this has been your YWC Champ. And I'm signing out.